Hey everybody, this is Hercules Pedix, founder, curator, docent, and gift shop employee of the Hercules Pedix Academy of Comic Book Studies. Today we're going to be looking at six snappy socceroos from the archives of the fabulous furry Freak Brothers. Actually, number six of the Freak Brothers comic. Um, this is a collection. It's almost all reprints. It's a collection of the Freak Brothers stories little standalone stories that were in rip-off comics, pretty much from like 75 to 1980. This came out in 1980. Um, I love this cover, really fun. I like the um, colors in it. And, uh, you know, it's signed Gilbert Shelton Art, but there's a little PM in like colored marker. And it's Paul Mavridis. As we shall see around this time, or a little before this time, Paul Mavridis started his long term stint as Gilbert Shelton's assistant on the Freak Brothers. And he does the coloring on this. It's pretty nice. It just leaps out at you. Very vibrant. Inside front cover, Fat Freddy's Cat. I kind of like this one. Um, Fat Freddy's Cat is uh, tapping on the window, trying to get Freddy's attention. He looks pretty cold. He's like, open up, open up. And Freddy's just laughing at him. And Franklin says, why don't you let your cat inside? He looks like he's freezing out there. And Freddy says, oh, that's what that is, huh? I thought I was watching a cartoon show on television. <laughs> this is a pretty good gag. First story, the parakeet that outwitted the DEA, drawn by Gilbert Shelton Solo. That's a lot of work in that panel. A lot of ink was spilled. The story's by Joe Brown. I've seen his name before on, like, earlier Gilbert Shelton stuff. Every now and then, I guess, Gilbert Shelton uh, runs out of stories, and his pal Joe Brown gives him an idea. So the Freak Brothers are dozing off, uh, all happily dreaming, and they hear a loud knock at the door. They all wake up and say, It's a bust! So Franklin eats up all the hash they have and Freddy eats all the acid and Phineas snorts all the coke to get rid of the evidence. So they uh, tidy up the place real quick and open the door. And of course, it's just a mailman. So they did that all for nothing. Man, Gilbert Shelton has really used this gag a little too much. I think this is like the fourth time I've read him do this gag with the Freak Brothers. It's getting a little tiresome. So uh, the mailman has a package for Freddy. And this is weird. Like all the, this is kind of a an example of how Joe Brown isn't as good as a natural, you know, storyteller slash yarn spinner as Shelton. Um, a lot of things in this comic, it's a lot of gags kind of unartfully strung together. Sometimes there's little plot turns where you're like, what? Well, okay, if you say so. You know, Gilbert Shelton's so good, it's seamlessly, you know, plot point follows plot point. It all makes a weird sense. But in in this this comic, there's a lot of things where you're like, what? Uh, okay. I don't really get it, you know? So all of a sudden, here's the example. Phineas is... Maybe because the drugs, he's like, he's like, oh my God, I think I'm going to get a job. And he's really excited about it. Which seems very out of character and just silly. He leaves to get a job. Inside the package, there's a parakeet with a note from Freddie's Aunt Sally. She says, here's your birthday present. It's your Uncle Artie. I turned him into a parakeet. He'll need three and a half grams of parakeet food per day. And then she writes for some reason, if you lose 125 pounds, I'll send you $10,000. And at the bottom of the birdcage, there's all these $800 cash lying in the bottom. Of course, it's covered in bird shit. And then the parakeet starts talking. It is Uncle Artie. It really is. Apparently, Aunt Sally's a witch or something. And he starts barking orders. He says, Freddy, you got to go buy a gram scale to weigh my food with. And he makes Franklin blow pot smoke in his face. And uh, 
while Freddy uh, washes that bird shit off of the money, he uh, tells Franklin the whole story. And, you know, basically says, my wife's a witch. I could turn you into a damn squirrel. Because I guess he's a warlock. And the only reason she turned him into a bird, or could, was because he was napping. She caught him while he was napping. I guess normally his magic powers counteract hers, and she can't do that. Meanwhile, Phineas is getting turned down at all of his job interviews. But this guy runs out of nowhere, and he says, You're perfect. We need another DEA agent. Offers him all this money. He'll get his own DEA ID. He says, you're a perfect undercover narc. He's like, no way, man. I don't want to be a cop. He says, no, no, you don't understand. We're making a movie about a bunch of DEA agents. But it's financed by the DEA. I guess it's a movie like kind of propaganda that'll make the DEA look cool. That's actually a real thing I've read is... A few movies, like kind of blockbuster military movies, actually were co-financed by the U.S. military. They figured it was good PR. So he agrees. They offer him a lot of money. And they even, the, conf the quote-unquote confiscated dope. The guy even says, yeah, have as much as you want. We don't care. We got tons of it. So Phineas goes off with these guys. Meanwhile, Freddy's uh, walking down the street and we see how the times have changed in our world and in the world of the Freak Brothers. They kind of uh, reflect the times. Because Freddy sees this head shop and he says, whoa, I haven't seen one of these in years. And like in the early Freak Brothers in like the late 60s, there was like a head shop on every corner near their house. You know, it was like head shops definitely had their heyday back then. Well, Freddy walks into the store, we realize there's these DEA agents, real ones, spying on the shop's customers. And they see Freddy, and they're like, oh, we gotta tail this guy. He's obviously uh, up to something. These guys are really dumb DEA agents. They're a bunch of chuckleheads. They're, they're actually, while they're on stakeout, they're just getting drunk, drinking beer. Inside the shop, Freddy is dazzled by all the new products they've made up in the past, you know, 10 years since he's been away from head shops. And he's so excited because he has $800. He buys like two of everything. Freddy's very impulsive. This is kind of an interesting character for Gilbert Shelton. I like how he does his frizzy hair. It's just white out and little black lines. It looks kind of neat. So Freddy leaves with this giant bag of shit. And, uh, of course, the DEA agents are like, holy shit, we got to follow him. This is going to be the biggest bust we've ever had. Meanwhile, Phineas is in the woods with the film crew. They, I guess the first scene, they're going to open fire on this plane, supposedly the drug smuggler's plane, and they do. And they say, come on out with your hands up. And these two guys are in the plane. And of course they're terrified. And they run away. And the guy who hired Finnis is like, there wasn't supposed to be anyone in that plane. Those poor guys must be scared to death. We don't want to get sued. So they run after the two guys. I guess they just, I don't know, were wandering around the woods and jumped in that plane for some reason. So they leave Phineas alone and Phineas goes in the plane and he sees all this amazing drugs, like a lot of good shit. He doesn't know how to fly a plane, but he says, oh, I could probably figure out how to ride it, drive it. And he folds up the wings and he drives down the freeway back home. He gets home all excited. Meanwhile, right behind him, Freddy crashes in the door with his uh, stuff. So the DE agents make their move and they bust down the door. They say, we're the DEA, hands up. But Phineas takes out his DEA ID and says, I'm DEA too. And all the other ones get in on the act. Yeah, we're DEA. And there's just a standoff. And then Uncle Artie starts screaming at these guys, yelling at them. He says, 
What the hell are you guys doing? Can't you tell that you're tripping balls? I'm a talking parrot. You can hear me talk. Parakeets don't talk. You guys must be on a really bad trip. And he, our Uncle Artie seems omniscient. He knows that they were drinking beer in the car and getting drunk all day. And he says, somebody put acid in that beer. It was in the papers. You guys are tripping hard. And the only way you can uh, come down is each you got to put each other's head in the toilet while another one flushes. So these D agents are really dumb and they do it. <laughs> so of course the Freak Brothers, uh, they get in the plane because Uncle Artie tells them, I used to be a pilot in WW2. I'll tell Freddy what to do. I'll uh, guide him. So they're heading to Spudville to see Aunt Sally. So here's an example of, this makes no sense. They don't even explain why. But when they landed Aunt Sally's, for some reason, Freddie has lost like, I don't know, 125 pounds. His clothes don't fit him. I don't, maybe he was sweating so much because he was nervous. It's just dumb. So Aunt Sally says, Aunt Sally says, here's your $10,000. You did lose the weight. And Freddie says, Aunt Sally, I'm here. We'll give you a bunch of opium if you change Uncle Artie back into a human. She says, I don't know if you want that to happen. He was a sheriff, you know. He might bust you, want to bust you guys. Freddie says, okay, turn him into a super dope dealer. And she does. And as the boys are leaving in the the plane that is now turned into a Cadillac by Aunt Sally, Uncle Artie says, I got a going away present for you. And it's a chicken in a cage. And I guess uh, all that opium made uh, Sally pass out. And uh, Uncle Artie took advantage of the situation and turned her into a chicken. Very odd little Freak Brothers story. Next story is uh, Phineas Goes to the Store. This one's written by Dan Baumgart. Never heard, saw that name before. This is like one of those strips that's a lot more loosely drawn in some places, but he does use like nice, I don't know, is that called duotone, the shading? So it looks like very kind of slick. But um, just an example, look at the work on this panel. Just all cross hatching and shading. It's, there's a lot more work in there. So they're out of rolling papers one day, the Freak Brothers. They got all this good pot to smoke. So Phineas runs down to the local head shop. And I guess he's like the one millionth customer of these uh, rolling papers. And he wins this contest where he actually wins the head shop. It's, he's the new owner. And the old owner just like tosses him the keys and says, good luck. A few hours later, Phineas realizes that he can't get any business, no customers. This little old lady comes in and she wants to buy books on how to turn hash, to make hash oil out of grass. I guess she's a really good pot grower and she's growing so much marijuana, she doesn't know what to do with it. So she, she doesn't have the room. So Phineas realizes this woman's kind of on the ball and basically they become partners. They, be, they become co-owners and she starts like bossing them around she seems to know everything about pot. And Phineas kind of realizes she seems pretty knowledgeable, so he is, uh, listens to her. So um, outside the store is this giant line to see the movie Space Crazed, a new sci-fi movie. It's a nod to Star Wars, obviously. As a kid, I was on one of those lines. It really was remarkable when Star Wars came out in 77. They were, I never saw movie lines like that in my life. They were just literally round the block. So she says, get out there and sell some stuff. These people are standing in line. They're bored. They're easy customers. They're easy marks. And it works. It makes a lot of money. But then these two guys come in and say, we represent a national chain of head shops that want to open up 
next to any theater showing Space Graced, they they realize that, yeah, it, it's a great, uh, easy uh, consumer pool. So we want to buy your store. They give them like almost half a million dollars. This is another one of the things, you know, Gilbert Shelton didn't do the story on this. Just like weird turns of events, like kind of out of character. Phineas doesn't even seem that high. In fact, I don't even think he's high at all. And all of a sudden he gets this idea in his head. He's like, what am I going to do with this money? I know, I'll make a movie, a science fiction space epic that's X-rated. And it's like, well, okay, what? <laughs> Why? So Phineas uh, hires all this crew, this giant crew. They start constructing sets. But he runs out of money halfway through the day, basically. And his partner, the little lady, shows up. And she says, I was down at the store. They told me you sold it. And uh, he says that he bought this movie company. And it's ours now. We'll be partners in that. And she says, nah, that's a dumb idea. I made a lot of money off that hash oil. So I'll pay, pay these people off before they stomp you. Because basically, he doesn't have the money he's supposed to pay him. But she, said, she says, I want you to give up this Hollywood nonsense. And I'm going to offer you a job as an official taster for mom's hash oil brownies, which she wants to market. Not a bad gig. She also gives him like a bucket of Cincinnati. And he gets home all excited to tell Franklin about his crazy day. And Franklin just says, where are the cigarette papers? So all that shit happened, but he forgot to get the papers. The original reason he went out. Once again, I know this is, it's a comic book, it's, but there's no way he could have done all that stuff in a day. <laughs> Gilbert Shelton wouldn't have done that, I think. Here we have He Who Hesitates. That's the name of this story. It's based on a true story by Manfred Mekskowski. I assume a friend of Gilbert Shelton's. This all looks really detailed and even like a different style. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if Jay Lynch helped out with this art, even though I don't think he did. He was in Chicago, but it looks different and it looks nice. It's very slick. Look at this amazing shading there. That's some, uh, that took some elbow grease. So once again, the Freak Brothers are out of pot. Phineas goes to the country to see their cousin Cow Freak uh, to buy some weed. On the way back home, he's smoking a big joint and a cop is behind him. And Phineas freaks out. And he runs this yellow light. <laughs> and then he just stops dead in the middle of the intersection. He panics. His, his feet are moving without his uh, knowledge. The cop car almost hits him. He, he ends up right in the middle of the intersection. He's furious. He's calling it in. And uh, this 18-wheeler comes barreling down the street, com completely demolishes his car. We see it off camera, or hear it off camera. He breaks down and starts crying. He's like, they make us pay for the patrol cars that we lose. And Phineas takes pity on him. He's like, ah, oh, don't take it so hard. Here, come with me. And we see weeks later, there's a party at the Freak Brothers' place. And this guy is saying, that guy over in the corner sure does dress funny. Are you sure he's an anarch, Phineas? And Phineas says, no, he's an old friend of mine. I can't even remember where I met him. It was so long ago. <laughs> so I guess this guy's just been hanging out at the Freak Brothers getting stoned all the time. This cop. And Phineas is so high all the time, he can't even remember. It was just a few weeks ago. We got a cute little Fat Freddy's cat strip on the bottom. The next story is a continuation of the story. It's called The Fourth Freak Brother. And this is the introduction of Paul Mavrides as a, an assistant, art assistant to Gilbert Shelton. And some nice slick stuff. I'm gonna double check if I missed. Did he do this one too? No, this is the first one, 1978. So one day the Freak Brothers wake up after a crazy party at their house at their apartment and they see that cop 
And they're so, you know, such fuck-ups. They don't even know who he is, even though he's been crashing at their pad for, like, weeks now. They wake him up, and the guy has no memory of who he is. And they basically say, yeah, you can crash with us, dude. We don't care. And he's so grateful. He's really uh, just like, oh, you guys are great. If there's anything I can do to help. So uh, he's kind of unofficially the fourth freak brother now, I guess, because he lives with them. Um, they head off to the Greyhound station. I guess uh, 500 pounds of Bolivian boo are coming in. And uh, they're going to pick it up. Meanwhile, we see the chief of police and the sergeant. Uh, the chief of police is furious because the newspaper is talking about uh, how Officer O'Mullet has disappeared. And it's probably a kidnapping. Obviously, Officer O'Mullet is that cop. He's, you know, been AWOL, getting high. And he's just pissed off about, like, it'll give the cops a bad reputation. I love the cartooning on this chief's face. This is around the time when Gilbert Shelton moved to France. And it really does remind me of some of those great, funny French cartoonists. It looks a little different to me than uh, Shelton's normal stuff. But then again, that could just be Palma Vritas. This is definitely, you can see the influence of Palma Vritas. This chunky, <laughs> fat cop here. So they, a phone call, they get a phone call. And it says, this is Terrorist Incorporated and we're holding Officer McMullet. I'm sorry, O'Mullet. Leave $100,000 cash in a lady's purse behind the candy machine at the Greyhound station or we're to kill him. That's some really good cartooning there. Turns out it's just these like punk kids, like literally punks. It's 1978. I guess Gilbert Shelton, the old hippie, his hip to the this newfangled punk thing. See these crazy uh, new wavy punky kids. So they agree to the the demands. Meanwhile, the Freak Brothers walk into the bus station, acted all nonchalant. The chief is there, and the sergeant, and the sergeant sees the Freak Brothers as as instantly convinced that it's them. They're the kidnappers. I could tell. I could smell the criminality on them. But they walk right past the the soda machine. I'm sorry, the candy machine. But he's still convinced. He's like, oh, it's some diversionary ta tactic. I know it's them. They pick up their their drugs, their giant crate of drugs. Oh, this is so Mavrita, as you can see it there. And for some reason, the chief of police sees a... Uh, the Freak Brothers lugging this giant heavy box and he's feels takes pity on him. He's like, ah, oh, poor stupid hippies. I'm going to do a good deed today. And he offers them a lift. But then the sergeant comes out. He tries to entrap them. He says, oh, guys, uh, did you forget your bag? Full of money. And then he even pulls a gun at him, shows his cards. He says, all right, where's a mullet? I know you guys got him. Of course, the Freak Brothers don't know what the, what the hell he's saying, what he's talking about. But then hearing his name makes Officer O'Mullet uh, wake up, basically. Remember who he is. And uh, the cops say, oh, my God, O'Mullet, it's you. We finally found you. And O'Mullet says, yeah, I remember you too, Chief and Sergeant. Chief Horrigan, you smart-ass, self-righteous, sarcastic son of a bitch. <laughs> and he just demolishes him with his giant crate of drugs. It says crunch. He's dead. I mean, look at him. And he knocks out the sergeant with one punch. And he's all excited. He's thrilled. He's like, guys, all the specialized deadly skills I learned in Nam. It's so... Great to have an opportunity to use them after all these years. I'm even better with a firearm. And he picks up the gun, the sergeant's gun. And by this time, all these cops are running to the scene because, you know. And he just starts 
massacring all the cops. Like, he kills 50 or 60 cops. It's just like a bloodbath. And uh, when he's done, he's all like, right on, brothers, right? Pretty cool, huh? And they're just gone. The Freak Brothers are like, what the fuck is this guy's problem? We see them running. Obviously, it's like Antarctica. We see these penguins. And they're like, keep running. We've got to make sure, put more distance between us. Like, I was nuts. And this little coda here. Because there was no witnesses, I guess, Officer Mullet, everyone thought he was a hero. And they gave him the money from the purse, which cured him forever of being a hippie. It was instrumental, however, in his later becoming a transvestite. <laughs> this is a very odd little epilogue. Here we have Take Me Out. And this is, uh, once again, the art team of Shelton and Mavridis. It's very nice. Some really tight, good art here. And I guess there's some uh, softball leagues forming in the neighborhood. And uh, they're signing up players. They all realize that, like, oh, we got to get on the bar Lester's Bars team. Because we'll get free drinks. So they get down to the bar and Lester says, guys, I'm, I'm all full up. I already had the tryouts. And he points them out to the Freak Brothers. It's all these heavy hitters. It's basically like he paid off some super good athletes. He's kind of loaded his team. But Freddie's just like, please, I'll do anything. I'll be an, a gopher, a ball boy. I'll do anything to be on your team. And Lester says, all right, I guess you could be on the reserve list. But that means you can't sign up for any other team, and you probably will never play in an actual game. So Freddie agrees. Phineas and Franklin are just like, ah, oh, fucking sell out. Phineas gets a spot on the, the health food stores team, the Rutabagas. And Franklin gets a spot on the drug stores team, the Whitecaps. They all train for the next few weeks in their own way, which means Freddie just sits around Lester's bar drinking beer. The, the first uh, game of the season, uh, the health food store is going to go up against Lester's bar. Everyone knows that Lester bar is like, it's like 100 to 1 odds. Everyone knows they're the, they're gonna kick everyone's ass. Everyone else is just kind of doing it for fun, but they're Lester's serious. So uh, Franklin asks Freddie to place a bet down at the bar for him uh, on Lester's bar, of course, because they're totally gonna win. Oh, I, I already like Gilbert Sheldon's cartooning, but I really like this Palma Vrida's. The slickness he gives it. So, uh, oh, I'm, I should mention this, guys. Look at this. Reading this last night, I don't know how I never noticed this. I, I must have noticed it and forgotten. But, Oh, I've probably seen this issue on sale in a, in bins and stuff during the comic sale. And I could have bought it. I could have bought one. But I had no note in my comic list that I needed this. I just spaced it. But thanks to Read Full Comics, I've got this. And uh, sorry, it's a poor substitute of the actual comic. So I guess Lester has this big plan. You know, he's uh, he's going to throw the last game and bet against his own team. And the odds are going to be crazy. It's going to be like 100 to 1. So he's going to make a lot of money. Franklin's pissed off because um, uh, they're going to the Whitecaps are going to play Lester's bar. And even though Franklin has been betting for Lester's bar to win the whole season. He doesn't want to bet his own against his own team. He thinks that's kind of you know shitty. But Franklin, uh, Freddie's just like I. You always bet on Lester's bar. I just bet your money on Lester's bar. 
So Franklin's so pissed off, he just doesn't want to play because the game's rigged, I guess. So the relief pitcher's brought in. Because Franklin apparently is like the star of the team. So this guy's shaky. Look at that crazy, like, it looks like Peter Bag, <laughs> This wiggly guy. But I guess his shaking throws off the batters, and he he's amazing. He strikes out all these guys. I don't know why, but this looks so Justin Greeny to me. The line work. And this just looks like fucking Harvey Kurtzman layouts. This is very loose and uh, animated. So, uh, Franklin doesn't want to lose his money. He's like, fuck, who cares about sportsmanship? Um, I got to throw the, the game. Let Lester's bars win. Because I have a lot of money on it. Okay, we can go back to the comic now, I believe. Yes. The real comic. So, you know, Franklin's pretending like he can't hit the ball. So then, uh, it's, it's kind of, I guess Franklin had this plan the whole time where uh, he basically said, uh, oh, I hurt my arm. I, is there a doctor in the house? And Phineas, I don't know what kind of doctor he's supposed to be, the big top hat. But he comes out and says, ah, oh, what's is the problem? And he says, I need some painkillers. I need you to prescribe some drugs for me. So I can finish the game. And he says, I just happen to have this bag of drugs that I took from the store. And of course the boss is like, what? He's like, oh boss, you know, I thought a situation like this might happen. So that's why I did it. So of course Phineas just gives him a prescription for all this good shit. And uh, right then, Luster's bar, uh, cause you know, he's just like, oh shit. We're going to win. The Whitecaps are uh, are losing. And I'll lose all my money. So he basically pulls a guy out of the game. And he says, oh, we have to pull this guy. I guess we have to forfeit. And uh, Franklin says, wait a second. You got your reserve player. And he points to Freddie. He gives Freddie a bunch of good drugs. And Freddie steps up to bat, tripping his brains out. He sees the baseball as a pumpkin, but he totally hits it out of the out of the park. And Lester's bar wins. Franklin's happy because now he wins all that money. Later on, though, Freddie comes back from the bar. He's got Franklin's money, and it looks like they beat the shit out of him. <laughs> Because he, he uh, screwed up the whole uh, scam. Another new Fat Freddy's Cat comic by Gilbert Shelton. I don't know if I mentioned this before, but all the Fat Freddy Cat strips are new. That's the only non-reprint stuff in here. This next one is The Death of Fat Freddy by our little team here. And uh, I like this little splash panel. It's really... Doesn't look like a Freak Brothers comic. It, it's, it almost looks like he's trying to make it look like some old weird EC comic or something. I have I assume that's about Rita's work by inking it really black and heavy. So one day the Freak Brothers get some dope. They're like, go oh, wake up Freddy. So we can get some dope. And they, Phineas goes in his room and he shakes him. He's like, oh my God, Freddy OD'd. He's dead. He's got no pulse. And, the, you know, they can't call the cops because they got drugs in their house. So they're going to do a secret burial, a secret funeral. They have this like, kind of a tag sale to make money for the funeral. They're going to sell all of Freddy's stuff. All these uh, hippie friends show up. And... They make no money because those, almost everyone has a story about Freddie owing them money or uh, not paying him back. So they're like, I'm taking this out in trade. He owes me $100, so I'm taking the, the hi-fi stereo. 
the interesting thing about this panel, though, is all of the visiting people are famous underground cartoonists. There's Willie Murphy. I think that's Spain. Though I don't remember Spain being ever that fat. He wasn't really fat. I'm not sure who these other guys are. Maybe that's Steve Sheridan or Jay, and or Jay Lynch, or that's vice versa. Definitely, obviously, Art Crumb. Aileen Kaminsky Crumb, he draws it like she would. And Trina Robbins. So they make no money for the funeral. They just decide to put him in a crate. They call up their friend who's like part of the Universal Church of Uncertainty or something like that. He can conduct funerals. He takes him to this place he knows of, this kind of secret burial ground. And they have the funeral. <laughs> a week later, the Free Brothers are already beginning to forget their tragic loss. It's almost like they forgot Freddie already. So they decide to have a picnic out in the country with all their hippie friends. And they realize that, oh, let's go to that, that nice, you know, backwoods area where we buried Freddy. We'll have the funeral there. They pick up a hitchhiker on the way, and it's this dude, this punk rock guy. He has a kill the Pope button on his lapel. And uh, he seems strangely familiar. Apparently, not only does he look familiar, but he also has the same proclivities of a Freddy. They get to the picnic again. He's so excited about all the food. He's just chowing down everything. He's just like, wow, potato chips. Wow, a bucket of fried chicken. And Phineas even says, looks like we found the perfect replacement for Fat Freddy. So uh, in, in his excitement, Fat Richie, that's the name of the punk, he drops a bottle of wine. And the wine seeps it in the ground and somehow wakes up the real Fat Freddy. And he says, I heard everything you said, you sons of bitches. Ah! Uh, Fat Richie runs off, freaking out. So uh, Freddy is like, it's kind of weird. He's literally beating the shit out of Phineas and Franklin. Kind of out of character for Freddy. They're like, you're alive. And uh, I guess on the way back, look how hurt the Franklin and Phineas are. They really look like they're roughed up. Freddie says, I OD'd on a ibogaine and I couldn't move a muscle. And Franklin says, be careful next time. We might cremate. That's a really odd Freak Brothers story, I gotta say. It almost seems like it should have been one of the dream comics they always have, you know? Like, Freddie should have woke up and said, oh. Another Fat Freddy's cat inside back cover. It's kind of cute. I really love this. This is Gilbert Shelton solo. Even though the work put into it, the slickness seems seems very Mavridas. Mavridas was a nut. He when he wanted to draw the shit out of something, he would draw the shit out of something. But man, look at Gilbert Shelton. Even in the distance, he draws every building pretty impeccably. But basically, this is uh, called Urban Paradise, and I love stuff like this for some reason. So does Shelton. He has a bunch of pinups like this that are just like, you could look at them for like five minutes and find all the stuff to look at. It's almost like Richard Scary or something. But um, we see at the this penthouse apartment rooftop, the Freak Brothers have this beautiful, almost commune in the middle of the city. There's uh, vines for grapes and Phineas is stomping stomping on them, turning them into wine. There's a jacuzzi, ping pong table. I couldn't figure out what this weird device is. I don't know, like some TARDIS or something. They got their own goats and chickens up there and pens. They got this really groovy house. And uh, I just, I love looking at stuff like this. This is something really, I would love a giant poster of this. That would be nice. So there you have it, guys. Basically number six of the Freak Brothers. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm pretty sure next issue starts the big stories. Um, you know, basically all the comics we've seen so far in the Freak Brothers series, how most of them are like stuff from the newspaper strips or stuff from ripoff comics. But now we're going to get into the 
the epic tales. So, uh, hope you liked it, and I hope to see you next time here at the Hercules Penix Academy of Comic Book Studies.